Well, uh, welcome. My name is Dean Tenney. I'm coming to you from my studio in fabulous Las Vegas. We have been working through an explication of the content outline for SIE, FINRA exam. We've done uh, section one, knowledge capital markets. We've done section two, understanding products. And today we'll explicate uh, section three, which is understanding trading, customer accounts, and prohibited activities. Please note, 31% of your exam, 23 questions. So the biggest two areas on SIE are section two and section three. Uh, please note, this is no substitute for the lectures. I uh, just want to remind you, for example, in the explications, there's things we're explicating in minutes that have hours of uh, lecture support behind them. So this is more to be used as an intellectual inventory to make sure you've got uh, you know, uh, what you need to know in terms of intellectual ownership. That's how we'd use it. I suggest you print the PDF so you can follow along. And I would have the PDF of this. You can be found on the FINRA, FINRA website uh, with you while you're studying, kind of do your own intellectual inventory. All right, well, let's get started on explication of uh, section three. We did one already. We did uh, section two already. And then you can see, I try and keep it in different colors. I'm not consistent about that, but uh, there's an example, right? Options, we got, you know, four lecture, three lectures on options for you. And we did that about 10 minutes the other day. Package products, got a mutual fund lecture for you there. And so here we are in section three. Understanding trading customer accounts and prohibited activities. Um, very testable, very uh, testable types of orders. Again, uh, I hate to sound like a broken record, but we have uh, types of orders as a separate lecture. It's about an hour. Most of my lectures are about their narrative. The, the narrative means it's not a teaser. It gives you everything you need to know about that subject area. And I think that comes in about an hour with these various things. Obviously, that's not what we're doing in here. But types of orders, market order is the only order we have where there is no contingency, no qualifier. Every other order has some kind of contingency or qualifier. But within market order, you want immediate execution at the best available price. And execution is uh, better or more important to you than is uh, price. Now, every other order, every other order has some kind of uh, contingency, you know, price or time, whatever the case may be. And in fact, our next one here is a stop order. It's called a stop order because the number one use of a stop order is to stop a loss. That's why it's called a stop loss order. There are other uses, but for SIE, I think that's sufficient. I mean, if you come back and do a seven, you'll find out we also use them to uh, protect profits, to establish stock positions. For, for SIE test purposes, I would know stop is stop orders are used to stop a loss in a long position. And if that's what you're trying to do is stop a loss in a long position, you're gonna place a sell stop below the current market price. Very testable, know where we're gonna place that order in relationship uh, to the current market price. And I'm telling my broker, if it trades at or through, stop the loss, send me home. You know, if I place a sell stop at the stocks at 50, I place a sell stop at 47, I'm gonna lose approximately $300. Approximately, because we don't know what the next trade is after that. And then we would uh, use a, uh, that was called a sell stop. We use a buy stop to stop a loss in a short position. And uh, very testable, they're going to place that uh, buy stop above the current market price. Uh, limit orders, limit orders, you want your price or better. So in a uh, limit order, you want your price or letter, uh, less than a buy limit. That's going to be your price or less. And uh, we always place a buy limit. Buy limits are always placed below the current market price. Very tells about where we place orders in relationship to the current market price. And as a uh, sell limit, you want to sell at your price or more. There's always an implied or better. So your price. Or more customers get hung up on this all the time. Nobody has to do business with you 
at your price or better. So, you know, this order may or may not get filled. I mean, the only order remember, that has no contingency, no qualifier is a market order. So here a buy limit is your price or more. And that is always placed. Uh, we're very testable where you place these. That's always placed above the current market price. We have a, um, a great mnemonic called Bliss and Slobs. That's a reminder is where we place orders in relationship to the current market price. So again, I'd refer you to the lecture there, but that's worth a lot of points. That stands for sell limits and buy stops. Stops are placed above the market because if you'd like, when you uh, pull the trigger on the stop order, you can turn it into a limit order instead of a market order. Again, this isn't an electron uh, types of orders. I highly recommend that you watch that uh, lecture. This is an explication of what you're held accountable for. This is not a lecture, it's an intellectual inventory. So very important in your intellectual inventory, you know where we place orders in relationship to the current market price. I'm warning you that uh, sell stops, plural, we can turn it into a market order or limit order once it trades through the stop. Doesn't matter whether we want to turn it into a market order or limit order, a buy stop that turns into a market order, a buy stop that turns into a limit order is placed above the current market price. And a sell stop that turns into a market order and a sell stop that uh, turns into a limit order are below. Uh, very testable uh, discretionary, or excuse me, GTC is a time qualifier. Uh, without a GTC time qualifier, all orders are day orders. So unless it says GTC, whoop, it's considered a day order. Now, you say, hey, Dean, uh, why do you keep calling me every day? And I said, well, I want to see if you want to re re-enter your limit order. You say, well, Dean, don't you know, bother me every day. Just make it good till cancel. So otherwise, it's unless GTC considered a day order. Nothing happens today. You know, the order gets canceled. Now, typically, the uh, we keep our clean up our order books in April and October. So we're going to tell the client, unless it's properly renewed, we're not going to... Uh, you know, we're going to cancel it. Uh, let's see, discretionary means your idea, broker's idea, discretion. That means the registered rep, the broker, I'll put RR, is making a decision about either action, asset, Or amount. If I'm going to make a decision as your broker about action, asset, or amount, action means buy or sell. Uh, asset means which security to buy or sell. Amount means quantity. If I'm going to make a decision about that, then I need to have a discretionary authority. I don't need that for time and price. Time and price is called getting good execution. That doesn't constitute taking discretion. So as a broker, I can make a decision about time and price without discretionary authority. I think a good way to remember this is the three A's. Three A's. That's how you would shop that through and see discretion not exercise means it wasn't my idea. Right. So I call you up and I say, hey, listen, excuse me, I'm not making a decision about accident, asset amount. I said, uh, listen, I'd like to check with you. And uh, with your permission, I'd like to proceed. That's called discretion not exercise. So discretion not exercise means even though I was a third party, your broker had discretionary authority, I didn't exercise it. And then solicited and unsolicited, very important, solicited means the broker's idea and unsolicited means the client's idea. Uh, bid and ask is very testable. Uh, you need to know from whose perspective the bid and ask is. Uh, the bid and ask, that's called the quote, the quote. And the quote is always from the dealer or market maker's perspective. So the quote is always from the market maker or dealer perspective. And that means whenever a customer is looking at a quote, he's uh, you know, always gonna pay the high price and he's always gonna receive the low price. What's that called? The securities industry. So let me give you an example of a market maker who has a bid of 15 and an ask of 16 and maybe it's eight by seven. This is very much a test issue on the SIE. You're gonna see something almost verbatim of what I'm explaining to you here. 
So, you know, you're looking at a quote and the bid is 15, the ask is 16, eight by seven. So this means a market maker is willing to buy eight round lots. A round lot is a hundred shares. into inventory at uh, 15 is willing to sell out of inventory 700 shares at uh, 16. So the market maker or dealer, those are synonymous terms, by the way, say I'm a market maker or dealer, buys at the bid and a market maker or dealer those are synonymous terms, sells at the ask or offer price. Very important. So let's just put that from the customer's perspective. And that's important too on your exam. Make really, be real careful about whose perspective they're asking from. And so, you know, let's just put in here, customer sells at the bid. and buys at the ask. So with this customer is looking at this quote, 1516, the customer is gonna sell at 15, it is gonna buy at 16. So very important, you're gonna see a test question very much like that on your SIE. Uh, trade capacity, trade capacity. So I say, listen, uh, you know, there's some firms that are order entry firms, meaning they don't have inventory. There are other firms that do have inventory. You know, so, you know, if you open an account with me at uh, Merrill Lynch, for example, I say at Merrill Lynch, we are a broker dealer. In some transactions you do with us at Merrill Lynch, Merrill will be acting as your broker, your agent, and on your behalf, contacting a third party for the security, and you're going to owe Merrill a commission. Now, in other transactions you do with Merrill, Merrill will be acting in its dealer principal capacity and be charging a markup or a markdown. In each and every transaction you do at Merrill Lynch, we're going to tell you in what capacity the firm acted, whether Merrill acted in its broker agency capacity or its dealer principal capacity. So that's very important. So we're all called broker dealers, but any one transaction the firm is going to be acting in either its broker, its dealer or going to be acting in its broker agency capacity. By the way, that's also on the con firm or its dealer principal capacity. Charge you a markup or a markdown. Again, I have a great uh, lecture on the secondary markets. It's like an hour and 45 minutes. I take this as a compliment. Somebody said, Dean, they were complaining to other people that my lecture, that lecture is particularly long and that at the end of that lecture, you could get a job as a trade on the trading desk. And I took that as a compliment, actually. You know, a lot of people who are using the channel are sending employees who will be working the trading desk or handing customer inquiries. And so uh, I took pride in what I think was supposed to be a dig, but uh, that's there for you. And I spend uh, a lot of time going over all the various over the counter markets and, you know, auction listed markets and all that stuff for you. Again, this is an explication. All order tickets have to be marked long or short. So in your two positions you have at a broker term are long where you own the securities or short where you're selling borrowed securities. That's the same, by the way, of um, options. So we're going to have a long or short position. The way we establish a, a long position is we check the order ticket at the broker term with opening purchase. You know, an opening purchase is used to establish or add to a long position. And if you want to go short, that's called an opening sale. An opening sale is used to establish or add to a short position. Now, naked, it refers primarily, it could refer to other things, but primarily it refers to on the exam, uh, naked or covered. 
with that primarily, there's other scenarios, but for, for SIE purposes, uh, naked means you're agreeing to sell a stock you don't have. You're agreeing to sell a stock you don't own. That's called a naked call. That's a short naked call. Naked because you don't have the uh, security. Now, the other version of this, primarily there's other scenarios, but this is the one they have in mind on SAE. The other version of this is you agree to sell stock you do owe. And that's called a covered call. And you should be able to uh, distinguish between those two on your exam because the, the basic test question here, by the way, let me get a thing here, is that uh, there's very few things that can subject you to unlimited risk, but this is certainly one of them. So, you know, if I come into a brokerage firm and say, I wanna lose so much money that you in advance can't tell me how much, you say, well, Dean, why don't you agree to sell stock you own? That'll certainly do the uh, trick. Uh, we should be able to know whether we're bearish. Bearish is when you sell short, if you sell short the securities, a uh, stock, we're talking primarily about stock here. So if you sell short stock, you're a bear, you want the stock to go down. And if you go long stock, you're a bull. So those are the two positions you have at a broker term. Uh, investment returns, uh, components of the return. So interest is what you receive on bonds. Dividends is what you receive on stocks. Realized gains is when you actually sell the stock. So if I buy Google at 85 and I sell it today at 2000 a share, I have realized that gain. Unrealized gain is I bought the uh, Google at 85, it's at 2000, I'm just looking at it. You know, the way I think of it is watching things go up is not taxable, right? Watching your home go up in the neighborhood in value is not taxable. It's taxable as you realize the gain by selling the security. And then your return is gonna consist of two things, income stream and or price appreciation. There's only two ways to make money in any investment where we're talking about a stock or a bond or a piece of real estate. And the only two ways you can make money from an investment is an income stream and or price appreciation. And those two things together are called total return. So well, here, if we have an investment that has no income stream, the only way we're going to make money through it is by selling to someone else for more than we originally paid for it, right? Uh, I would know on your exam that cash dividends are taxable. So cash dividends are taxable. I wouldn't worry about uh, this idea of qualified. I mean, if you hold it for a certain length of time, you'll have a lower tax than ordinary income, but you know, who cares for tax purposes? What you need to know is that cash dividends are taxable, are taxable, and stock dividends are not. You don't have a stock dividend, you just have to adjust your cost base. So you just uh, stock dividend, I don't remember me telling you this, you can do the math, but you don't really need to. Uh, you always end up with more shares at a lower price. So you can just shop the answer set on your test and whatever offers you more shares at a lower price, uh, that's the answer. The exception would be if it's a reverse split, which I don't think there'd be less shares at a higher price, but I don't think you'll see a reverse split. Uh, dividend payment dates, very testable. We have a great mnemonic for how to remember dividend uh, payment dates. And the mnemonic we have is DERP, DERP. That's the chronological order, the declared date. That's when the board uh, declares the dividend. Very important, you don't have a right to a dividend. You only have a right to a dividend if declared. So, you know, the board at the quarter says, okay, what's our net income? How much of that do we wanna keep into the corporation as retained earnings? How much do we wanna distribute as a dividend? And then the board is going to uh, have what's called the record date. They said, we're gonna look at our shareholder list on this date. And if you're a shareholder as of record on this date, you're gonna get the dividend. And then we're gonna have the payable date. That's when the board actually pays it. Now, in the uh, securities industry to show up on time on this thing, you're gonna to have to buy the stock. You know, you just don't buy the stock today and become an owner of record. You know, we're going to have a, what's called the X date, very testable. I put it in a different color because the X date 
is not set by the board of directors. The X date is a function of secondary trading and what we call the UPC, the Uniform Practice Code. And the X date, X means Latin for without. If I say, do you have an X spouse? That means you're no longer trading with your spouse attached. And so the X date is the first date, there are others, on which the stock no longer trades with the dividend attached. And the X date is gonna be one business day, I would definitely know this, one business day prior to record. It makes sense that it's uh, one business prior to record date because remember T plus two is regular rate settlement. Settlement is when ownership changes hands. So a good way to remember that is DERP. That's the chronological sequence. I would know the X date is not a function of the board. That's a function of the Uniform Practice Code of FINRA in New York in terms of secondary trading. Uh, concepts of yield, by the way, you remember, you don't have a right to a dividend. You only have a right to a dividend if declared. Uh, one more point here, let's add this up here. I didn't add this, but let's go ahead and add that while we're up here. Oh, kind of low probability question, low probability, but I would know that 50% uh, of a cash dividend paid from one corporation to another is tax 50% uh, tax excludable. corporation paid to another corporation is 50% tax excludable. Again, these aren't lectures, but you know, I'm more than willing, you know, I'll probably, if you put in the comment box a question, I'll probably say, did you watch the lecture? I'm kidding, but you know, we're trying to go through these explanations pretty quickly, but I'm pretty good. If you put something in the comment box, I will respond to you. Uh, that's on the YouTube channel. So uh, you definitely need to be able to do current yield uh, on your exam, what an investment pays you divided by what it costs you. So definitely should be able to crunch current yield. Now, in these other yields, it's more about the relationships. And so, you know, uh, if you want to sound smart and somebody asks you about economics or finance or investments, you say it has a lot to do with interest rates. And if you just shut up, you sound good. You know, but a bond will either be trading at a discount. If it's trading at a discount, what we're interested in is the yield to maturity. I should say par or discount, you know, to make an informed decision. You know, because it's likely I'll be able to hold the bond to maturity. It's not likely it's going to get called away from me. So par discount, the yield we're interested in is yield to maturity. And a bond at a uh, premium trading at more than that, we're going to be interested in yield to call. You know, sometimes the way we refer that is yield to worst. What I'm interested in is what is the worst yield I would expect? You know, if it's trading at a premium, it's because interest rates have gone down and it's very likely that they're going to call the bond away from me, that they're going to replace high cost debt with low cost debt. And so that's why I want to know the yield to call. Uh, cost base, again, just like a stock, you know, uh, you know, you buy a bond low, you sell it high, yo taxes. In a muni bond, the only component that's tax-free is the coupon. Uh, benchmarks and ind indexes, the two I'd be aware of is the S&P. Well, there's three actually I'd be aware of. I mean, again, low probability, but the S&P 500, uh, the uh, uh, Russell 2000, and the uh, Wilshire 5000. You know, if I ask you about, you know, large cap stocks, S&P 500, if I ask you about micro top stocks, uh, Russell 2000, small caps, and the entire universe of the uh, domestic U.S. market, Wilshire 5000. And the reason that's important is because a lot of investment advisory firms, a lot of mutual funds use those benchmarks as a comparison to how they perform, right? I want to pin, uh, pick the benchmark that most closely approximates uh, what, you know, what I'm doing. Now, um, the Dow Jones is kind of overrated as an index, but you know the Dow Jones is a price-weighted index, which is ridiculous. Yeah, and I had somebody tell me they, they had a question like that, which is kind of wild. The, other, the others are, uh, you know, what we mean is that it's just a simple average. They take the 30 stocks and divide, and it you know, means that some one stock could have a huge impact on it. The others are price-weighted, not, excuse me, are uh, market cap-weighted. Again, low, low probability. Settlement is when ownership changes hands, and so T, I love this T, the only thing that settles on the trade date is cash settlement. 
So you wanted to have something settled on the same day, you would tell your broker, I want to do this for cash settlement. Uh, T plus one, we have a couple things that trade T plus one. One of the things that trade T plus one is options. I would know that and govies, government securities. US, when the, when the test, by the way, uh, we mean US government securities, right? The states are considered municipal issuers. So govies. Uh, T plus two, very te uh, testable is going to be for corporate securities and municipal securities. Uh, big, physical means can you transfer and ship it? You know, some people like to have physical evidence of the, of the loan they've extended, a bond certificate, or physical evidence of their ownership in the company, a stock certificate. And in certain securities, there is no physical evidence. There is no certificate. So you'd be confused if you say, hey, Dean, transfer and ship my treasury securities. You know, U.S. treasury securities are book entry. There's nothing to transfer and ship you. You know, the U.S. treasury has you on the books. They agree to send you the checks at the appropriate times. So U.S. treasury securities are book entry, meaning there is no physical certificate. Uh, the other one I'd be aware of that is a book entry are uh, state GOs. Most state general obligation bonds are um, book entries. So if I call California and say transfer and ship my bonds, they say, you know, you must be new. There's nothing to transfer and ship. They're book entry. Uh, corporate actions. Uh, types of corporate actions. We talked about splits. Remember, there's not a, a tax consequence to a split. You have uh, more shares at a uh, lower price. If it's a reverse split, that's embarrassing, but a reverse split you have less shares at a higher price. And that's the whole point of doing the reverse split. Uh, companies buy back their stock into the treasury. And when they buy back the stock into the treasury, they can either do that in the open market or by making a tender. And the stock they buy back is called treasury stock. So the board might say, hey, we got excess capital. What should we do with this capital? We don't need to run the business. Uh, we could pay a dividend. Let's start buying back some of our own stock in the market. And that stock that they retire is called treasury stock. That is stock that has been purchased by the issuer. We sometimes refer to that as retired stock has been retired by the issuer, bought back. And treasury stock uh, has no dividends and no voting rights. You know, Mr. Buffett uh, has announced he's going to be doing $50 billion worth of uh, uh, buybacks of uh, a Berkshire Hathaway stock, and he's going to make a tender off. Rather than buying in the open market, he's going to go directly to the shareholders and say, would you like to tender your share shares? Uh, right now, uh, Amazon is going to be tendering for MGM shares. They're going to make you an offer as an MGM shareholder. Would you like to give us your stock for X? And you can say no, or you could say no. That's called a tender. Once I make the tender, it has to remain open, whoever, whether it's the company or some other company for 20 days. Uh, exchange offers, we'd like to offer you an exchange, the bonds you're holding for you know, new bonds or stock, whatever that may be. Uh, rights offerings, very testable. Rights offerings are uh, the mechanism used to offer to offer existing owners the opportunity to maintain their proportion offer. Used to offer existing shareholders. Existing shareholders. The first right of refusal on the issuance of new shares. You know, because, you know, if we issue the new shares, you don't get an opportunity to buy them, you're gonna get diluted. now. We have, you know, you can choose to participate or not in the rights offering, but I would definitely know that the rights offerings are short term and exercisable below the current market price. You know, you should be able to contrast rights and warrants on your exam. Uh, impact of stock splits in uh, market price and cost base. Uh, you're going to have, again, as I said, either more or less shares. Let's just do the first one here. 
Now, Apple split their stock uh, four for one. Tesla split their stock five for one. And so, you know, what's going to happen in terms of the stock split is there's going to be no effective change in proportion ownership because you either have more shares or less shares. But so does everybody else. And as we said, it's not taxable. You're just going to adjust your cost base. So let me just uh, give you one that's uh, I buy 100 shares of Apple. Uh, Apple at uh, 120. That's my cost base. Apple splits two for one. As I mentioned, you don't have to be able to do the math. You just need more shares at a lower price. But here I'm going to have now 200 shares at 60. And again, this isn't a lecture on stock splits. It's an explication of that. Reverse would be the opposite. I would have uh, less shares at a higher price. So kind of embarrassing when we have to do that. GE, can you believe that? They did a 10 for one reverse. So every 100 shares, now you have 10. You have 10 shares for every 100. And now you have a, a higher uh, cost base. So it goes up or down depending on whether it's a forward or reverse. I'll, I'll do that. I'm not trying, I'm trying to avoid a lecture on this stuff. I'm trying to explicate, but um, forward splits, more shares at a lower price. And then, you know, you know I, that means almost always you, you just, if you know that you don't have to do the math, you can just shot the answer set and reverse splits, less shares at a higher price. Uh, again, there might be adjustments to the security subject to whatever corporate action they took. You know, we file bankruptcy, we might get wiped out if we own the common stock, right? Uh, delivery of notices and corporate actions. The corporation is going to notice, not, uh, notify you, and they do that by proxy. And remember, you uh, that means you don't have to attend the meeting to uh, vote your shares or make these decisions. So uh, here, you know, the test question is that broker-dealers, a lot of uh, customers are holding their stock at BDs in what's called street name. And broker-dealers cannot charge to forward proxy material, charge notices on corporate actions. For securities that are held in street name, meaning in the name of the brokerage firm. Okay, so proxy and proxy voting. Again, you can uh, vote without attending the meeting is what that's about. Okay, cash accounts, where you, where you intend to pay in full. Those are the two basic types of accounts we have at a brokerage firm. Uh, cash account, you intend to pay in full. Very testable to know that there are some accounts that are required to be cash accounts. The one that's high risk on the test is UTMA accounts. UTMA or UGMA accounts, I would know on your exam, must be cash accounts. You can't leverage up the kit. Right. The other one would be retirement accounts. Uh, margin accounts is where you intend to pay part of the purchase price. And you want the broker dealer to lend you the balance. And wish the uh, broker dealer lend you the balance. I wouldn't get too much in the weeds on this, uh, but I would have a general understanding. There's additional documentation required to open a margin account, uh, a credit agreement, which is mandatory. That does you understand that you're borrowing money from the broker dealer and you're paying interest. Uh, the uh, hypothecation agreement. That does you understand you're uh, pledging your securities as collateral for the loan. And therefore the securities are going to be in street name. And then, the one that is not mandatory, those two are mandatory, but the one that's not mandatory is the loan consent form. That's where we tell you we have other customers that we wish to lend your securities to. That's called the loan consent form, and that is not mandatory. The other two are uh, options. We're going to have to give you an OCC disclosure document. The characteristics and risks of options, all the bad things that can happen to you all the bad things that can happen to you. So we give you the OCC disclosure document. And then I go back and try and get the account approved by a registered option or uh, principal. 
account approval. He says, Dean, did you give them the, uh, you know, the OCC disclosure document? I say yes. And then they can do their first trade. And if they don't have that uh, option agreement back within 15 days, within 15 days of account approval, all they're going to be allowed to do is closing transactions. They can only get uh, rid of the stuff they got. Let's give them incentive to get it back to us. And a good way you might want to remember that is Dato 15, right? Disclosure document is the D, right? Account approval is the A. Uh, first trade, this is the T, option agreement back within 15 days. Uh, we talked about discretionary versus non-discretionary. Now we're just not talking about the trades. We're talking about the account itself. And to have a discretionary account, that requires principal approval uh, prior to the first trade. So, you know, I say, I got a, a discretionary account. My manager says, oh, you know, no, you don't. You don't have one till I approve it. Now, remember what that means is I, as a broker, I'm going to have authority over action, asset, or amount. approval prior to the first trade. Uh, fee base versus commission. You know, we have a lot of us have at broker terms what are called wrap accounts where we wrap our products and services into a fee. The services of products and services of our broker dealer and our affiliated uh, registered investment advisor firm. So we're wrapping our uh, products and fees. So if it's fee-based versus commission, again, I'm gonna have to give you a brochure and then I have to make sure that I'm making the decision that's in your best interest. I mean, you may be better just to, you know, um, be able to, you know, uh, order all the cards. So a brochure that tells you what's included in this fee and what's not. And, and as I mentioned, you might be better in the commission version only, right? So commission, the relationship is free and you're paying for the transactions. In a fee, you're paying for the relationship and it includes a certain amount of brokerage services and investment advisory services. Uh, make sure on your exam that you can uh, distinguish uh, 529 versus Coverdale. There is definitely a question about uh, Coverdale's versus um, 529s. And so 529 versus Coverdale. And usually the question is about that the uh, 529 has more flexibility. It's not means tested, whereas the Coverdale is. And so, you know, what they're trying to get at on that questioning exam is something about, you know, it'd be better for somebody who's high income or wants more flexibility. I'll just put that there. And that is definitely uh, on the test. Customer counts, uh, you have to be able to contrast uh, joint tenants with rights or survivorship. versus tenants in common. Again, that is very testable. And uh, in a joint tenants with rights or survivorship, there is no fractional interest. Both parties own 100% of the account. And uh, the decedent share goes to the surviving party. And either party can act. And the surviving party can act after the person passes on. Whereas tenants in common, there is a fractional interest. 80, 20, 50, 50, whatever the case may be. And the seed and share goes to their state or beneficiary. And when somebody uh, party in this one dies, the accounts get uh, frozen. That is very much a test question. Uh, corporate account, we need a copy of the uh, corporate resolution saying who's going, which corporate officer is going to be able to trade the account. And if they want to uh, borrow money, we're gonna need a copy of the corporate uh, charter you know, the point here is there's going to be re additional documentation required. Uh, same thing for a trust account. We need a copy of the trust agreement. Uh, 
Uh, the thing that we're particularly concerned about is if they want to do margin, margin would have to be specifically permitted in the corporate charter or the uh, trust agreement of this, for example. Uh, my very testable. I can't imagine any draw in which you don't get a, a couple of questions on UTMAs. Uniform Transfer to Miners Act. You can stipulate up to the age of 25. The test questions are no margin. Again, this is very testable. I don't know of any draw which you're not going to get tested on this. No margin. It's a cash account. One on one. What that means very testable is one miner one custodian per account. Uh, the kid's tax ID is the minors. That's very testable. I can't imagine you not getting tested on a, a Uniform Transfer Minors Act. Per, either You're getting at least one question. You might even get more on those. Uh, there's no special documentation necessary. I just, you know, get the new same new account form and put, you know, Dean Tenney as custodian for Aaron Tenney, UG, UTMA, Nevada, state wherever I'm at, Nevada, NV and the kids tax ID. Uh, partnership, same thing. We need to copy the partnership resolution saying, you know, which uh, partner is allowed to trade the account. And again, we may need a copy of the partnership agreement depending on what kind of uh, things they want to do. Uh, IRIS qualified, very important on the test. Uh, qualified means you're using pre-tax money. So that means you have a zero cost base, very, very important. Qualified means zero cost base. You're using pre-tax money. Money that does not have paid tax on it. So you have a zero cost base. That means everything coming out is going to be taxable. Everything coming out is going to be taxable. Uh, there's gonna be required minimum distributions. Test question at 72. And 72, so, you know, the IRS wants to make sure they get a chance on uh, uh, getting to this money. So that's 72, uh, I would know that. Uh, contributions we said are pre-tax and a qualified plan and contributions are after tax on a non-qualified uh, plan. Anti-money laundering, anti-money laundering. The definition of money laundering. Well, what we're trying to do is turn dirty money into clean money, right? And there are three stages of money laundering and we should be able to recognize them so we can prevent them. The first stage of money laundering is placement. The second stage is a layering. That's where I mix my dirty money with my clean money. And then integration where you can't tell my clean money from my dirty money. <laughs> you know, I was reading about this guy who uh, um, <laughs> got caught with a SAR and he uh, was skimming the por parking meter uh, meters. And I thought, well, how much money can he and it can he skim, and it uh, you, it ended up being uh, lots and lots of money. I mean, it was ridiculous. It was hundreds of thousands of dollars. The the sad thing was the bank did the the, uh, the port authority didn't catch him. The um, the bank did because they f filed a SAR because he didn't have any uh, explanation about where all these quarters came from, which was again um, bad form. Uh, here are stages of money laundering. I just told you what the stage, stages of money laundering are. Uh, structuring is when you try and avoid the 10,000. So a CTR is for more than 10,000. So for more than 10, we're gonna file a CTR. Doesn't mean you're a crook. It just means it's going to do. Now, structuring would be when I try to avoid that. You know, like you know, instead of I've got a bike, a motorcycle for twenty-one thousand, and I got the guy a cashier's check for the twenty-one thousand bucks. If Dean would have came back with three cashier's checks for seven, that'd be structure. I told you what layering is. Layering is uh, where we mix our clean money with our dirty money, and then play integration is when we're at the end of that, right? In every uh, brokered firm, we have to have written supervisory procedures about anti-money laundering. Those are called WSPs, about how we're gonna do that. The SAR is for 5,000 or more. That's for transactions that are commercially illogical. That's why I got the guy with the parking skim, meaning skim. He had 
no explanation it was commercially illogical about this guy depositing two tons worth of quarters. Uh, that's for our 5,000 or more. And for transactions that are commercially illogical. We said the CTR is for more than 10. I'm trying to put the, the stuff that I'm talking to you about in different colors so you can actually make the distinction uh, between you know, what Dean is telling you versus what's in the actual outline itself. And let's put that in there. That's for more than 10. Uh, I would expect you to get at least a couple uh, things here. Um, at least a couple uh, money laundering. They love that $10,000 question. That's there. So you'll get a couple. Uh, they like to ask you about FinCEN. That's where we file that. Let's put and get this. Oh. More than 10. And then FinCEN is where we file that. Uh, that's where that goes. And then I would know this is uh, the Bank Secrecy Act is what allows banks to uh, tell the government about these things, you know, because usually that's your confidential information. Uh, books and records and privacy requirements. The vast majority of brokerage from records are three-year records. There are very few that are lifetime and six. Uh, confirmations have to be in the mail by settlement. Account uh, statements are quarterly. Uh, let me, I got lazy here in my different colors. I want to go back to not being lazy. Uh, statements are sent quarterly with one testable exception. And that exception would be if you have a penny stock in your account. If you have a penny stock in your account, then monthly. And a penny stock is a non-NASDAQ OTC stock under five. Uh, holding the customer mail, I can hold your uh, mail uh, for you, uh, you know, depending on how long you're going to be traveling. But I can't do it for convenience uh, past the quarter, right? If I hold it for you, you know, at some point I'm going to say, well, listen, this, you know, I can send it to you electronically. Uh, the exception to that would be for security purposes. You know, if I ask you to hold my mail, you said, Dean, you, we've been holding your mail now. You know, you can get electronically. We're not supposed to be doing this just for convenience. And I said, well, it's not convenience. I'm in Mindanao in the Philippines. We're kidnapping as the largest uh, industry. And if I go into an internet cafe and pull up my account, it's very likely I'm going to move myself up on the kidnap list. Every broker dealer on his website must have two links, one link to uh, be the uh, business continuity plan. So there's going to be a link on the BD's website to the uh, business continuity plan. And the other one that's gonna be there is another one to broker check. Broker check is where I you know, put your name in there, hit enter and it tells me whether you're a rogue broker or not. Uh, if we wanna cross solicit, we have a, a responsibility to make sure that we're uh, maintaining confidentiality of your information. And so the exception would be, testable exception is if the US government wants to know something about you, right? Then I'm gonna you know, roll over quickly under the Patriot Act. But in general though, we have an obligation to keep confidential any information we uh, collect on you. A regulation ISP is not just for brokers, but you can imagine we have a higher standard because we you know, have tax ID numbers and you know all kinds of stuff about you. And so we have to tell you what we're doing to safeguard that information. Uh, communications with the public, we have to maintain a do not call list, uh, people who've asked not to be bothered. And uh, that's called the Telephone Consumer Protection Act of 1991. I would also know that you're not supposed to make me making cold calls before 8 a.m. in the morning or after 9 p.m. in the evening, wherever the phone is ringing. Uh, best interest obligations, know your customer to make sure I'm making suitable uh, recommendations. I have to make sure I know uh, a lot about you uh, to be able to do a good time, I make a good recommendation, excuse me. Uh, market manipulation, we're not supposed to engage in market rumors, uh, pumps and dumps. I'm, I'm, I'm making up a lecture on 
uh, ethical and unethical business practices. So I'm going to put all this unethical, ethical stuff in there. So uh, I will give you a more background on pumps and dumps and front running and, uh, you know, excessive trading on this ch churning and, uh, you know, uh, marking the close and marking the opening, uh, backing away, free riding. <laughs> so let's just go over these a little slower. I think market rumors are pretty, pretty standard uh, fare, but pump and dump is where, uh, you know, I pump it, there's more demand than supply, but I'm artificially creating the demand by restricting supply. So that'll make the stock go up and then I unrestrict the supply and then I dump. It's a typical of a penny stocks. They're easy to do what we call pump and dumps. If you saw a Wolf on Wall Street based on a real guy named uh, uh, Jordan Beaufort, uh, Stratton Oakmont was his firm and they were masters of the pump and dump. Uh, front running is trading ahead of customers. That's a big no-no. Churning is there trades that are excessive in size and frequency. Uh, more about my me making commissions and you accomplishing your, your goal. Marking the close where I do a, a trade just at the close to cause an uptick so I can sell short tomorrow. That's a big no-no. Marking the opening is the same thing. I do a trade at an uptick higher than the previous trade, not because I really want to do anything, just because I'm trying to uh, go short. Backing away is failing to honor a firm quote. I would know that one. Let's go ahead and put that in there. That one's... That's the most high risk one on the SIE is that one. When we were talking about that market maker who was willing to buy at 15, sell at 16, I think it was eight by seven. And so backing away is when a market maker fails to honor a firm quote. If you get that on the test, I'll just say a market maker fails to honor a firm quote. This is a prohibited practice that is known as, and you go backing away. Free riding is a buying and selling without paying for the buy. You took a free ride, you didn't pay for it. And typically what we do to people who do that is we freeze their account. And if you get your account frozen, that means 90 days, no credit privileges. Uh, privileges, let's see, my spelling skills are suspect here. Insider trading, very testable. We have to have, uh, that's trading on material non-public information. And again, we have to have something in our WSPs, our written supervisories, a section on this. You know, we ask every broker to read and sign off on our WSPs because that way if you say you didn't know it, that's trading on material non-public information, big no-no. A definition is non-material means something would alter somebody's decision. Like had you known about it, you wouldn't be involved in it. Uh, identifying involved parties, and it, involved party is anyone, but that's a pretty broad definition. This is important, so let me get out my different color. That's anyone with access to material non-public information. Uh, penalties, I would know is three times the profits. It's both civil and criminal, meaning civil means you're going to write a check and the criminal means you're going to go to jail. So it's both civil and criminal. And I would definitely know on the uh, civil side, it's uh, three times the profits. Sometimes they say treble damages. So if I make 9 million, I'm going to owe 27 million. I remember I'm supposed to say, gee, there's hardly any profit in it anymore. Right. Um, uh, we're not as a broker. They must be so cool to work at a broker term and get first dibs on these hot IPOs. I say, no, you know, in fact, I'm not allowed to have an IPO. And that's to make sure that our customers get the IPOs and we don't keep all the good stuff for ourselves. So uh, if you're an associated person of a broker dealer, you're not allowed to, par to participate in initial public offerings of, of companies your uh, broker dealer is taking public. Uh, borrowing from your customers is a big no no. Be careful on sharing in customer accounts. That's kind of an odd one. Uh, you would think that would be no, but in SIE fantasy land, if I go to my manager, my principal and say, you know, this customer and I have really bonded. We're simpatico. We've decided we're going to open up an account together and we're going to split 50-50. The answer in the real world is, are you nuts? But on the test, I can share in a customer account with proportionate capital and principal approval. Not likely I'm going to get that.
you know, cap, proportionate capital means, you know, if I put in a, a 800 grand and a customer puts in 200 grand, it's 80, 20 on the split. So that's what proportionate capital means. Uh, exploitations of secure seniors, very testable. It's so depressing how many people are trying to, you know, rip off seniors every day. My mom is 76 and she gets all kinds of people trying to rip her off every day. Seniors 65 and firms got to have some kind of procedures. The ones that we, a lot of us use is ask our seniors to give us a trusted contact person. And so that if we have, you know, transactions that are suspect that we can reach out to that trusted contact person, you know, we put a hold on the transaction, we reach out to them. Uh, you're either registered or you're not. And so, you know, if you're not registered, you can't receive commissions. Uh, you can't solicitate, solicit customers and take orders. Falsifying, withholding documents, big no-no. Signature of convenience or people get in trouble for asking customers to sign blank uh, authorization forms so they don't have to track them down. You know, yes, is it convenient? Yes. Is it wrong? Yes, right? So falsifying. So signature of convenience is a no-no. Uh, you're supposed to respond to regulatory re uh, requests. Uh, Finra tells me that's the number one violation is people not responding to their requests, which <laughs> shocks me. Uh, prohibited activities related to maintenance and book and records. So uh, somebody asks you to destroy records, you should say, no, I don't think so. All right, well, now again, I'm going very quick on these explications. And the reason I'm going uh, quick is because I'm not trying to redo uh, lectures. I'm trying to give you an intellectual inventory. Uh, but I have had people tell me they found these explications to be helpful. And when I started uh, through these explications, I said, well, you know, if nobody finds them helpful, we'll just hit the delete key and we'll stop uh, moving forward on these explications. But uh, since people uh, find them uh, productive, we'll do section four and that will conclude the explication of that. I'm trying to keep these about, you know, 45 minutes to an hour. So I understand I'm going quick uh, and then my own uh, psyche problem is I'm not quite sure I should be putting up substitutes because that's not what these are for the actual lecture content, which is, you know, hours on these subjects. So, you know, with that caveat, I'm willing to continue on uh, with these explications. So um, I'll put this up for a premiere. And then remember the uh, premiere, I say this every time, even though I know if you're watching this, you obviously didn't know this, but you know, on every premiere on the YouTube channel, we run a live uh, question and answer chat alongside the premiere. And during that live question and answer chat, I answer any questions you have about the lecture that you're watching or any other FINRA or NAS exam questions you may have from other exams. So it's a nice opportunity for us to be able to, you know, kind of almost uh, have uh, some uh, in-person contact, so to speak. So uh, remember when you see a premiere on the channel, there'll be a live question and answer chat. I'm gonna try and figure out if you're testing early too, how to make the uh, lectures uh, share it with you privately so you can get it early if you need it. Okay, I'll see you on the next thing. Uh, we got section four to do. It'll probably be a while because I got to put some stuff up for some sevens and some 63, 65, sixes, sixes. So maybe a couple of weeks before we, we finish out the explication. Remember, uh, questions in the comment box. I'm pretty good at responding quickly to any questions you have. If you want them in the comment box underneath the uh, YouTube uh, video you happen to be watching. All right. Bye-bye. Like, share, uh, comment, and I'll see you next time.